Committee, um, and we'll begin with Senate Bill 455. Senator Koenig is going to present on behalf of Senator Roberts, who has a good excuse of being in South Korea right now. So whenever you're ready, Senator. Thank you, members of the committee. Senator Andrew Koenig from 15th District here to present Senate Bill 455 uh, um, for Senator Roberts. Um, this is a bill, deal, a tax credit bill, dealing with um, adoption. Um, currently, we already have it. This would make it refundable. Um, there's a $6 million cap. And if you look at the fiscal note, there's, as far as, um, uh, you know, in 2022, there was only 19000 that was rede redeemed. So we're well, well below the cap and I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, do you know of that, and I'm, I apologize, I don't know that I have the fiscal note, um, or at least not in front of me. Do you know of that 19,000, how much of that would have been, would have qualified to be redeem, re, refundable? Well, since they were redeemed, then that means they did have a tax liability. Oh, okay. So the que I guess yeah. the question is how, much how many not? more, how much more would have been redeemed if if someone tried if to do it and it didn't have a yeah. tax liability? Yeah. And I, I don't know. Uh, I don't have to answer that question. Okay. I don't know if anybody knows. Okay. Um, I mean, sure, it could e easily have doubled or tripled, but it is a very small amount of money. Okay. Got it. And I do think encouraging adoption in the state is 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 beneficial. Sure. Um, you're not changing the individual amount, though, the individual cap. Is there an individual cap? Uh, yeah, I believe the cap is being removed. For the individual, too? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Any witnesses that would like to testify in support? Please come forward. Fill out a witness form. Gotcha. Thank you so much. Thank you leave that there and whenever you're ready just tell us who you are and begin hi um, my name is Elizabeth Allen I'm the executive director of the gift of hope adoptions which is a licensed Missouri child placing agency um, thank you so much <laughs> for for having me and um, I am here to register my support for the changes um, that Senator Koenig talked about um, in the uh, Missouri adoption tax credit proposed in in this bill. Um, it's estimated that in the U.S., one-third of American families have expressed interest in adopting. However, only about 2% of American families actually end up completing an adoption. In part, this is due to skyrocketing adoption costs in all types of adoption, including public, private, domestic, and private international. Um, this can leave families in the lurch who might have a lot of love to give and stability to be able to raise a child, but perhaps not the disposable income to pay large fees associated with adopting. Um, the agency I work for, Gift of Hope Adoptions, primarily does private domestic adoptions, and we're licensed as a nonprofit child placing agency here. I can tell you that one of the very first questions that we are asked when we get an inquiry from a prospective adoptive family is about the average costs and if we know of any resources to help defray those costs. Um, we do always reference the federal adoption tax credit as well as the Missouri adoption tax credit um, when that's applicable, it usually is. Um, many families decide not to pursue adoption though because of the high cost, particularly those who just don't have a lot of money saved even though they're doing fine month to month. Um, while the tax credit may not help with the upfront costs, knowing that some of those incurred costs can be refunded can go a long way in peace of mind for anxious waiting families. Um, most private adoptions will incur more expenses than both the federal and state tax credit com combined, actually, um, far more. Um, average de domestic private adoption costs are generally listed nationwide as between twenty dollars and $60,000. And in the last couple of years, the several families I've worked with um, have told me that it's definitely closer to the fifty dollars or 60000 mark than the, than the 20000 mark. Um, this is an average of all the services required to complete a domestic adoption, which may include um, home study and post-placement supervision fees, um, counseling and case management for the expectant mom or birth mom, living or medical expenses for the expectant or birth mom, advertising or networking, legal fees, travel, and any number of administrative costs depending on the type of adoption entity you use for all of these things. 
in all private adoption, adoptive parents are on the hook for all the expenses, whether for services for them directly or their child's birth parents. And a lot of those expenses or fees are at risk since a birth parent can change their mind and decide to parent. Um, additionally, there are far more waiting adoptive families hoping to adopt privately than there are private adoptions annually in the U.S. Some statistics place the hopeful waiting families between 1 and 2 million, while actual annual private placements are between 18 and 20,000. That means for every baby or child placed privately, there are between 50 and 100 waiting adoptive families for that child. So the families who adopt privately could have costs that have been spread out over several years and possibly even several failed placements. And unfortunately, there are many such families. Knowing that eventually they could recoup some of that would take some of the burden off them. Average international adoption costs are certainly on par with the average domestic adoption costs and can, of course, be higher, particularly if you factor in travel fees, um, additional fees like translation fees and that sort of thing. Um, they, so they could include costs in the country you're adopting from as well as costs here in the U.S. While adoption through the public foster care system can be free to the adoptive family, if not the state tax taxpayers, there are occasional situations where the adoptive parents end up paying for certain fees, usually legal. Um, there are also situations that can slip through the cracks of the public system, such as when fam a family has guardianship of the child and the state basically leaves it there. Um, I worked on one such case where the adoptive parents had a child that was basically dropped off at their home at age three and the birth mother never really re returned to care for her full time. The state did a basic check, but since she was in a safe and stable family, didn't really do much else. The family wanted to pursue adoption, but had to save up for an attorney and a private home study to do so. And by the time they could, both parents were on disability and the child was now a teenager and wanted to be adopted so that their last name would be on her high school diploma. In this case, and others like it, the refundable tax credit would be huge for a family and cover a majority of the fees that they've paid and catch some of those kids who fall through the cracks of our public system. And while I've talked a lot about prospective adoptive families because they're the ones who would be accessing that tax credit, it's really important to remember that adoption is about finding a forever family for a child who needs one, not necessarily finding a child for a family. The adoption tax credit follows the child being placed. So I think it's really important to recognize that the tax credit could be the difference in the right forever family being available for that child rather than that family deciding not to pursue adoption as a way to build their family because the financial burden is just too great. It might help a family be able to take on a sibling group or an additional sibling later on, or it might help them be able to afford additional specialized care or equipment needed to give that child the healthiest start in life. In any case, I think any help we can give adoptive families is going to be beneficial for that child. And I would like to see all Missouri children safe and secure in their forever families, whether through biology or adoption. Thanks. I'm happy to take questions or now or later. <laughs> Thank you for your testimony. Any questions for this witness? Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else here to testify in support? Anyone here to testify in opposition? Uh, in support right here. Oh, oh I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's I'm okay. Sorry. That's okay, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, uh, Samuel Lee with Campaign Life Missouri to go on record in support of uh, uh, Senate Bill 455. And, and thanks, Senator Koenig, for uh, covering for Senator Roberts, who graciously, uh, enthusiastically agreed to file this bill. Um, just to answer your questions, in terms of what the law is right now, um, and the law was changed two years ago, uh, it is a $10,000 up to $10,000 for the non-reoccurring adoption expenses. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is the individual cap. Uh, there's a House bill, a companion bill, that just came out of committee yesterday, um, House Bill 714. What they've done, they've actually added a, a cost of living increase on that $10,000. So that could, in fact, the way it's, it's structured, it would only increase and never decrease on a COLA. Um, and that's just something, just throwing that out there for you to consider if that's what you'd want to do. The key thing here is that the $6 million statewide cap, which, Madam Chair, you're the one who amended it and raised it from $2 million to $6 million mm -hmm. uh, two years ago. Uh, if you don't recall, I do, and very grateful for that. That would be removed completely. Uh, part of the reason why the, the, the fiscal note is sort of like, well, why is this? Two years ago, it was only special needs adoption, uh, and, and now it's all adoptions. So I don't think the law is completely in effect. But I don't think that's reflected yet in, in any fiscal note for, well, 2020, 20, or 
2021. So for 2022 or 2023. Um, so I think it's sort of this sort of zero to unknown right now. Um, but by removing that $6 million cap and, and making it refundable, I mean, it opens up particularly for your lower income and middle class families who want to adopt uh, but can't afford to uh, by making it refundable will make all the difference in the world. And if there's, you know, there aren't that many refundable tax credits, but I think this one certainly should, should be given serious consideration to be one of them. Thank you. And thank you for jogging my memory. Yeah. Um, it, we canceled this hearing, and so it's been a few weeks right. since I've read this, but um, it, is there another bill in the House that does something similar with the foster care tax credit? Do you know? Well, there was... There was there was a foster care tax deduction, which was which was part of the Senate uh, House Bill 429 and House Bill 430, which uh, Senator Rader and Senator Koenig had. Mm -hmm. uh, you amended one or both of those, I yeah. forget which. Um, I, I I don't know if there's anything on the foster care tax deduction, uh, but for foster care tax credit, I I, I don't think so. I I, okay. I, I don't I think may, there is. Yeah. I may follow up. Someone raised that. Um, and so I, I think I was conflating some of the legislation out there. But right. appreciate so. that clarification. Any yep. other questions? Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Anyone else here to testify in support? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Senators, Tom Dempsey, registered lobbyist for Catholic Charities, Archdiocese of St. Louis. There isn't anything that I could add to the testimony that you could that you've already received so I'll just say for the reasons previously previously stated we'd like to go on record in support thank, thank you very much any questions appreciate your brevity <laughs> anyone else here to testify in support Good afternoon, I'm Timothy Faber, and um, I'm with the Missouri Baptist Convention. And I think today uh, we are finding that Baptists and Catholics agree, Democrats and Republicans agree. And um, with that, I agree with everything that's been said in favor of it. So. Thank you very much for that testimony. Anyone else? Or any questions? Thank you. Anyone else? Good afternoon, Chair and Committee. My name is Kurt Wickmer, and I represent Missouri Catholic Conference in support of this bill. Simply put, every child deserves a loving, supportive family, and we think this bill will make it easier for that to happen. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Any questions? Seeing none. Any other witnesses here to testify in support? Anyone here to testify in opposition on Senate Bill 455? Anyone here for informational purposes? Seeing none, Senator, any closing remarks? Thank you for the hearing. Thank you. We will um, now continue on and hear Senate Bill 424. Okay. As you're getting settled, Senator, we'll, we'll go ahead and call roll to establish a quorum. Jessica, whenever you're ready. Arthur? Here. Williams, Carter, Moon, Mosley. Having established a quorum, we'll continue with Senate Bill 424. Senator Washington, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, committee, for hearing me today. This is a bill that's been filed a couple of times. Um, nationally, it's known as the Crown Act. Uh, basically, this bill says that. Um, we will uh, prevent any discrimination against children in K through 12 or pre-K programs based solely on the texture or style of their hair, so long as that is related to their ethnicity um, or race as defined in the bill. Um, we found it before, um, just a few examples of what has happened. I think there actually was a child recently here in Jefferson City whose hair was cut off um, because uh, they didn't like it, but um, this, there have been lots of studies to show that we may um, all have some inherent bias based on the texture of someone's hair that grows out of their head the way it does. We've had children um, 
be prevented from graduating from high schools. We've had children whose dreadlocks were cut in the middle of wrestling matches. And we've had children that were treated differently based solely on the way their hair grows whether and whether they choose to do afros, braids, locks, twist, or whatever. So with that, um, I'm open to any questions. Thank you, Senator. Are there any questions? Seeing none, do you have any witnesses here to testify in support? I think, I think we do, yes. Sure, come forward. Please be sure to fill out a witness form and Perfect. Whenever you're ready. Okay. Chair Arthur and committee members, thank you for um, holding a hearing on Senate Bill 424 today. My name is Kaylee Adams. I am a undergrad student at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. I am studying criminal justice and criminology, and I'm here today on the behalf of the Associated Students of the University of Missouri, or ASUM, as you may have heard around the building. Um, we are a nonpartisan advocacy organization that speaks for the 75,000 plus students across the University of Missouri system. ASUM stands in support of Senate Bill 424 for a variety of reasons. Firstly, this bill personally impacts myself and students like me. I grew up in St. Charles, Missouri. It's a predominantly white area, and I hated my hair growing up. I thought it was too much work, that it was too messy, um, too different. And throughout my childhood, I heard a lot of the typical comments that get directed at people with textured hair, that it's too wild, too frizzy, or too curly. And when I was getting compliments on my hair, it was often because my mom and I spent more than four hours to get it pinned straight. And when I finally entered college, I started to learn how to love my hair. And that was also when I first learned how to properly take care of my hair myself. Yet, I still worry that when I go for an interview, Wearing my hair down might be too much. And sometimes I spend extra time in the morning trying to make sure my hair isn't too frizzy or that it doesn't look untamed. Unfortunately, this is not a unique experience to me. According to the most recent ASUM survey of the UM system student body, 15% of respondents indicated that they faced some kind of racial or ethnic discrimination. And 76% of whom were non-white students. In a Princeton University study from students from kindergarten to 12th grade, it found that black students are disciplined at a rate four times higher than any other racial or ethnic group. Specifically, black students are more likely to be suspended for discretionary reasons such as dress code or long hair violations, neither of which have been found to be predictive of student misconduct. These bills have also had robust support in other states. Bills prohibiting discrimination based on hair or hairstyle are already law in 20 states, including Tennessee, Nebraska, and Louisiana. And in Missouri, it has become law on, munis on the municipal level in Kansas City and St. Louis. It has also been introduced into the legislation in 24 states, including Kansas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Kentucky. We respectfully ask the committee to join the movement to prohibit discrimination based on hair by passing Senate Bill 424. If you have any further questions about how this may impact the UM system students, I'd be happy to speak on those issues. And thank you again for your consideration. Thank you very much for your testimony. Mm -hmm. Any questions for this witness? Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Anyone else here to testify in support? Seeing none, anyone here to testify in opposition? <clears throat> Madam Chair, members of the committee, Ray McCarty with Associated Industries of Missouri, again this year objecting only to one section of the bill, and that's the definition of race um, being modified to include hairstyles and hair textures um, for the purposes of the Missouri Human Rights Act. That part causes us difficulty. We have no position on the remainder of the bill. Um, we're concerned that um, even people who are, uh, we know this bill is primarily um, as we understand it, pointed toward making sure that African Americans are not discriminated against and fully supportive of that. In fact, many companies have policies that prevent such discrimination based on hairstyles and hair textures. But policies are easier to manage than defining, uh, modifying the race definition in the Missouri Human Rights Act. And the Missouri Human Rights Act and the Human Rights Act in general has been held to apply to uh, Caucasians as well as other races. Um, so, uh, as was pointed out on the House side during testimony, 
there is a concern that uh, people who uh, may uh, use a certain hairstyle, try to walk a certain way, may try to take advantage of this and claim discrimination when in fact they aren't even in the group that you're trying to help protect. Uh, for that reason, I believe they did change the House version to delete that race definition. We have no problem with that bill now. So we just recommend that you take a look at doing that same thing here. Thank you for your testimony. Any questions? Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else here to testify in opposition? Seeing none. Anyone here for informational purposes only? I'm too slow on oh, I'm sorry. I'm moving sorry. quick. No. I'm moving I'm too quick today. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jessica Petrie here on behalf of the National Association of Social Workers, Missouri Chapter. I apologize for missing the call, um, but we also want to go on record in support. Social workers work in many educational settings um, as behavioral health professionals, and so they have seen the impact firsthand of what happens when a student is not able to achieve to their full potential in athletics or other extracurricular activities solely because of their natural hair texture. And so we're really excited um, about this legislation that Senator Washington has proposed to start addressing this issue. Thank you very much. Glad you got to testify. <laughs> Any questions? Seeing none, anyone here for informational purposes? Seeing none, any closing remarks, Senator? Yes, I just wanted to address Mr. McCarty's remarks with respect to race. Um, I'm not sure if he has seen the Senate committee substitute that we have prepared. It is the exact uh, same as the House version. Race has been taken out of what the bill has been in the last six years, and we have a full definition of race that um, will identify that um, that it has to be associated with your ancestral origin and ethnicity, cultural attributes and physical characteristics, and then uh, with the protective hairstyles, those would be protected if those hairstyles are actually um, because your hair texture or your hairstyle is something that would be um, from your ethnicity and or uh, cultural origin. So with that, I just ask that we pass that. Um, I have natural hair myself, and so I am treated totally different uh, when my hair is not straight, um, as if I um, am not have not conformed. And um, the thing that we've said in here before, but I'll say again on the record, is one of the reasons more African American and people from the African diaspora throughout the world um, have started turning to natural hair is because it is very uh, detrimental to our health to continue to have perms. Um, right now there's a, a national class action for women who have had fibroids and are hysterectomies and how it is tied to having uh, chemical perms in your hair. So that is very damaging for um, probably all women, but for African American and those from the African diaspora, so many Latino people as well. So with that, I'd ask that we at least start with protecting our children so that they can go to school without being bullied, shamed, or treated differently simply because of the way they were born. Very good. Thank you, Senator. Um, we'll pause, and I would make a motion to move into executive session. We have a second. We have a second from Senator Mosley. All in favor, say aye. aye. All opposed. We are now in executive session. I make a motion that we bring Senate Bill 213 before the committee. Do I have a second? Oh, 313. Sorry. It's probably an important distinction. 313 up for uh, executive session. We have a second from Senator Mosley. All in favor say aye. All opposed say no. Um, we, this is the bill that we heard a few weeks ago establishing the restaurant meals program in SNAP. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, I don't know that I made a motion. Um, to do pass. So I make a motion that we vote Senate Bill 313 out of committee do pass. Do I have a second? We have a second from Senator Mosley. Um, so we'll go ahead and take roll. Arthur. Aye. Williams. Aye. Car er, Carter. Moon. Senator Moon left his vote with the chair. He voted no. Mosley. By your vote of three to one, that uh, measure is voted out of committee due pass. I now make a motion that we leave executive session. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor vote aye. Aye. Any opposed? 
the ayes have it. Okay, we will now take up Senate Bill uh, 440. Senator Washington, whenever you're ready. Thank you again. I'll make this really quick. This bill has been deemed the Walter Concrete Walter Cronkite Act. It would um, provide a, a little more protection for freedom of press for students that are um, in high school papers. Right now, high school um, publications do not have that freedom. Uh, there has been a case that has gone before the Supreme Court almost 20 years ago um, that said that if there's that there are publications can be censored if they. Uh, um, only for those issues that are reasonably related to pedagogical concerns like related to teaching uh, your teacher or something of that nature. But even that um, get, puts censorship on our high school students. Uh, this bill um, would eliminate that and allow them uh, to actually have the same freedom that any other um, media would have. Um, and it needs to be media. It can't just be a child that's on Facebook or whatever the case may be. Um, Personally, if not for being at a high school newspaper, I wouldn't be here today. Um, it provided me an opportunity to research my community. It provided me an opportunity to learn to write properly. It also provided me an opportunity to learn to think. And so with that, we don't want to censor those students, whether they go on to journalism school as I did. Um, we don't want them to be um, couched in what they do and restrict their ability to think and go forward. Uh, so this bill seeks to help us train future journalists and provide freedom to those school journalists to eliminate any administrative strongholds and prevent any administrative retaliation. Or now, um, things have changed a lot in the last year, any community retaliation because children who are um, in this in, in high school papers and um, news publications shall should be able to enjoy the First Amendment rights where we make no law that abridges the freedom of the speech or of the press. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you, Senator. Any questions? How, this bill has been around longer. Way, way before me. Than way before me. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I mean, it's kind of an oxymoron. We'd send our kids to school to learn, and uh, high school journalism is a way to learn. My brother also uh, was a high school journalist and in fact became a journalist um, he died uh, three years ago, I think he was 66. He'd been a journalist for over 40 years. And that um, seed was planted in him in high school. Um, it provided him an opportunity to not only travel the world, but if you're a CNN watcher, if you watched some Fox News, if you watched Al Jazeera, my brother more than likely wrote some of those stories that you watched. And so um, I don't think we should be restricting these kids. It'd be the same as taking away a calculus class. It's the same, while they can still take the class, what use is it if the teacher um, doesn't allow to, isn't allowed to teach them and the administration tells them what they can cover? We are America, and they should be able to uh, have the same Bill of Rights as everybody else. So hopefully we can get it through. Um, there have been um, challenges, obviously, in the past, but I know we passed it out of this committee last year, and I hope we can do it again. Thanks, Senator. Anyone here to testify in support? Come on up. My little tiger here. <laughs> We're happy you're here.
Thank you. Any questions? Seeing none, thanks. Anyone else here to testify in support? Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I am Mark Mossen with the Missouri Press Association. For the various reasons that were given here today, I am in support of this bill. This bill has been heard for several years, you are correct. Um, we also feel this is good for our industry. We need to encourage young journalists to choose this profession. I'm also turning in a witness form from Missouri NEA, and also in support of this bill. I'd be willing to answer any questions anyone might have. Thank you for your testimony. Any questions? Seeing none. Thank you. Anyone else here to testify in support? Anyone here to testify in opposition? Anyone here for informational purposes? Seeing none. Senator, do you have any closing remarks? Just echo what was said. We just need to provide our future journalists with the same rights that we provide everyone. And the only way we can continue real journalism is to uh, let our children know that we have their back. So I urge that we pass this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. That concludes the hearing on Senate Bill 440. I now make a motion that we adjourn. Do I have a second? You got to say second or we'll be here forever. <laughs> All in favor say aye. Aye. Any no's? We're adjourned.